It was love at first sight and nothing has changed. But I still remember that day as if it was just yesterday, the delight of my eyes, the racing of my heart, the overwhelming of my senses, the feverish anticipation of that moment when what I'd only ever imagined and dreamed of finally became a reality. And I drew near and embraced my first piece of Kentucky Fried Chicken. What a moment. I will never forget it. The taste, the texture. I was in love. But what does my love for delicious fried chicken have to do with what we're looking at today? Well, let me ask you the question. What is love? I mean, let's just say a total stranger came up to you and asked you, what is love? What would you say? How would you explain it? Would you say it's a feeling you have? It's a personal preference, what the world needs now, chemistry, desire. What is love? What does it look like? Actually, the answer to that question is far from straightforward, isn't it? Because when it comes to love, everyone's got an opinion. Our friends, our family, movies, music. And everyone's got an opinion because love is important. It's something we're all looking for. It's something we all need. But not only that, the word itself can mean different things to different people in different situations. For example, when I say I love Kentucky Fried Chicken, it's different to saying that I love my wife Pearl, or at least it should be, because loving my wife Pearl like fried chicken would be kind of strange and awkward, wouldn't it? So back to our question. What is love? Well, to answer that question, let's go to the Bible and see what the Bible has to say about love. And when you Search through the Bible, it mentions love 686 times. And there's one particular place in the Bible where it's mentioned more often than anywhere else. Because 46 of those 686 times are found in the five chapters of 1 John. And there is a greater concentration of love language in 1 John than anywhere else in the Bible. And what that tells us is that 1 John, among other things, is all about love. But who was John, and why did he write his letter? Well, the Bible tells us that John was a fisherman, one of the 12 apostles, the brother of James, the author of 2 John, 3 John, the Gospel of John, and the book of Revelation. And why did he write this letter? Uh, why did he write one John? Well, thankfully, he actually tells us in chapter 2, verse 26, and he says to those he's writing to that I'm writing these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. He's writing so that the Christians receiving his letter wouldn't be misled by those who were telling them the truth about Jesus. But that's not all. He's also writing to remind them in chapter 5, verse 13, that those who trust Jesus have eternal life. That is only through trusting in Jesus that a person will be forgiven, set free, and made right with God. That's why John has written 1 John. But in the midst of all this, He's also got a lot to say about love. And to begin with, let's zoom into chapter 4, where John says something really extraordinary. Can you please come with me in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8? And here in verse 8, John says, Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. And then in verse 16, he says, And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. If I asked you to finish the phrase, God is, what would you say? God is powerful. He's the creator of all things. God is merciful. God is good. God is just. And God is holy. They're the type of things that we'd be tempted to say, wouldn't we? But God is love? That sounds a little bit strange. God is loving. That makes sense. But God is love. How does that work? Well, to understand what John is saying here, I need to introduce you to another God is. And that is, God is Trinity. Three in one. God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Well, while I'm sure that many of you have heard of this before, have you actually thought about why the Trinity is so important? I mean, what's the big deal about God being three in one? I mean, Frankly, doesn't it just complicate things? After all, how do you even explain it? It's hard to get your head around. And people over the years have tried all sorts of ways of trying to explain the Trinity. For example, uh, people have said the Trinity is like water. 
And there's the water illustration. A trinity functions like water insofar that water is one thing that can exist in three different states, ice, liquid, and steam. But while that kind of makes sense, it doesn't really work. And if you push it too far, you get into all sorts of trouble, especially because water is always one or the other. Ice can't be steam at the very same time. Then there's the egg illustration. God is like an egg in that one egg is made up of a shell, an egg white, and a yolk, three in one. But again, we have a problem with that because while it may be the one thing, there's still three distinct parts which are independent of each other. So that doesn't really work either. Uh, one illustration I found that gets a little bit closer is thinking of the Trinity like an equilateral triangle where you have three sides which are all equal, which come together to make the whole, without which the whole is not able to exist. But even though that's close, it's still not quite there. In fact, there is no illustration that doesn't fall short in some way. And you actually, if you're interested in finding out more, there's this great little video that's come out of the Gospel Coalition where Sam Albury unpacks this a little bit further. Quite helpful. You might want to look at that. But back to our question. Given how hard it is to explain, why do we make such a fuss about God being Trinity? Well, let me give you at least... Three reasons. And the first reason is quite straightforward. It's actually what we find in the Bible. You won't find the word Trinity itself in the Bible, but you'll see God as Trinity all over the place. Uh, for example, when Jesus is baptized in Luke chapter 3, verse 22, we're told that the Holy Spirit descended on him, Jesus, like a dove, and then a voice came from heaven saying, You are my son, whom I love, with you I am well pleased. Do you see how that works? The Holy Spirit descends on Jesus, and then God the Father says, this is my Son, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Let me give you another example. At the very end of 2 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul closes with what many of us know as the grace. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. There are many more examples throughout the whole Bible. The first reason the Trinity is important is because it's just what we find in the Bible. Secondly, the Trinity is important because Jesus needs to be God in order to save us. Because Jesus needs to die on the cross as God to pay for the sins of the whole world. Because even though Jesus lived a perfect life and never sinned against God, if he was just a human being and not God, he could only pay the sins for one other person, a life for a life is all we could do. Thirdly, and coming back to the question we started with, of what does it mean when John says that God is love, the Trinity is actually important because it answers our question. Because what does it mean for God to be love? It means that God in himself, as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is love. That from the very beginning, before time itself began, God has been in perfect, loving relationship within himself. The Father loving the Son and the Holy Spirit. The Son loving the Holy Spirit and the Father. The Holy Spirit loving the Father and the Son. In other words, what John is saying when he says God is love is that God in his very essence and being as Trinity is love in himself. That love is part of what it means for God to be God in the same way that water is wet and fire is hot. God is love. And how does knowing that help us? Well, it answers the question, what is love? Because if God is love, then God defines love. And we can know what love is by turning to God. And what do we discover when we turn to God? How does Jesus love the Father? In John chapter 14, verse 31, we're told that even though Jesus is God, he goes to die on the cross. Why? So that the world may learn that I love the Father and do exactly what my Father has commanded me. The Bible tells us that Jesus lives for the sake of his Father, putting the Father before himself. And it's the same when it comes to God the Father and Jesus his Son. 
In Philippians chapter 2, verse 9, we're told that God exalted Jesus to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 27, we're told that a God the Father is placing everything in the universe, the sun, the moon, the planets, kingdoms, rulers, even us, under the rule of his son. Everything will be his. It's quite extraordinary. Yet in the midst of all this, back in verse 24, we're told that Jesus will hand this all back to the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority and power. That when Jesus defeated all of his enemies and rescued all of his people and has that name which is above every name, rather than holding that for himself, he will give it back to his Father, such as the love Jesus has for him. And while all this is going on, what does the Spirit do? The Spirit is loving the Father and the Son. And in John chapter 14, verse 26, we're told that the Holy Spirit will be sent by the Father in the name of Jesus to teach Jesus' disciples all things and to remind them of everything he said. That in the midst of all this, the Spirit will be serving the Father and the Son, putting their interests before his own. And this is love when it comes to the Trinity. And this is what it means when the Bible tells us that God is love. And while the world around us may tell us that love is romance, love is feeling, love is sex, love is chemistry or desire, all those type of things, because God is love and has always been love as Father, Son and Spirit within the relationships of the Trinity, what love is then is what we see in God. And what do we see? We see that love is putting others before yourself and the actions and emotions that go with doing that. That love is putting others before yourself and the actions and emotions that go with doing that. That's love. That's what love is. And getting that right is really important because getting it wrong can lead you down the wrong path. I'm not a great fan of rom-coms or teen dramas, more of an action movie sci-fi fan myself, but I found, my, I found myself watching The Princess Diaries one day, which in case you haven't seen it, it's about a young girl who discovers that she's actually a princess. Compelling viewing, I highly recommend it. Nevertheless, there's this scene from The Princess Diaries that's always uh, stuck with me. And uh, here's this budding princess talking with her mother about what she hopes from her first kiss. And what she hopes for is that when she has her first kiss, her foot would pop, it would lift up, like in the movies of old. And here's one definition of love that many people have, that love is this overwhelming of emotion, that love is romance. Love is where you lose control. You just can't help yourself. Your foot will just pop. And while to a certain extent there's nothing wrong with saying that, you know, it's just a movie, I'm sure that a generation of teenage girls went looking for that type of love and ended up being sorely disappointed. Because, you know, love's not like that outside of the movies most of the time. Yet we, we know where this kind of sentiment is coming from, don't we? This whole idea that love's supposed to be this special and extraordinary and difficult to find thing. If we only we can find our soulmate whose name is written in the stars, then we'll be able to experience love in all of its fullness. That's the idea of love that many people have in their mind. And let me ask you, have you ever thought about love that way? As you've thought about love and as a result, have you ever found yourself worrying that you may never find it? That you won't find the right person? that you might miss out because, uh, you know, plenty of people are doomed because we're all looking for love and we all need love. And because looking for love is just part of what it means to be human, that fear of missing out can be very real in our lives. And that's especially the case if we've had bad experiences in our own family or history. Or we struggle with the whole idea that we of all people deserve to be loved. And as a result, we can go looking for love in all the wrong places, can't we? Entering relationships with people we shouldn't. Crossing boundaries we shouldn't. 
making poor decisions that are hard to come back from. Getting it wrong about love can have terrible, lasting consequences. But given what we've seen about love in the Bible, this doesn't have to be us. Because now we know that God is love. And that God and God alone shows us what love is. And as we'll go on to see in the Bible, that God is not only love, but a God who loves as well. And it shows us that love, the type of love that is found in the Trinity, which places others before themselves, who shows us that love in the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ for our sins. And what that means is that we have nothing to fear when it comes to love. We're not going to miss out and we're going to find it because the God who is love knows how to love us.